Uh, I'm uh, hello. We are starting a minute or two. I'm gonna explain everything about uh, CE and CME credits in a minute. I see questions already about it. Just uh, hang tight. We're gonna talk about it. Okay, it's noon, so hello everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Bia Carlini, I'm a Northwest APTC coordinator for our webinar series and I also wear two or three more hats uh, at uh, Northwest APTC. As this first slide says, uh, the questions uh, about the presentation will be taken at the end, but you can, of course, answer the questions at any time. So we keep collecting them. Um, and uh, we, uh, we also want to let you know, and we always got a lot of questions about this, this webinar in PowerPoint will be made available uh, in 24 hours or so at our uh, website, which you can see uh, the link below. We also always make uh, this uh, version uh, ADA compliant, so uh, uh, you know that is something to also keep in mind. Okay, so uh, Today we are doing things a little different. We are very excited that we partner with our colleagues from AHAC Western Washington and uh, working partnership with them means that especially and specifically for this webinar, uh, you're going to get uh, certificates of attendance if you are interested or CME, uh, Continuum Medical Education, through uh, one credit uh, through the American Academy of Family Physicians. We really appreciate uh, AHAC uh, facilitating this process with us. What you have to do, you have to do nothing if you are watching in your computer and entered your email as registration in four or five weeks we are going to get an email with a certificate um, CME or otherwise and the this certificate won't come from us will come from uh, an email from AHAC particularly uh, with the term of the, the, the part of the email is going to be whatcom.edu uh, so you're going to see this email and it's going to be your certificate that comes in the PDF. However, if you are watching in a group, it's three or four of us, of you that are watching, we don't have a, a way to send a CME certificate or a CE certificate for each of you. So in this case, you need to email us. This is the email there below, uh, northwest at attcnetwork.org telling us in this specific X registration dash email, these are these were the at attendees and give us the name and the email. We want you to do this in uh, uh, less than 24 hours, by the end of today, max it by 9 a.m. tomorrow. So please do that. I'm gonna repeat a little bit this information at the end. Uh, the, all this, if you notice that it's not getting to you, uh, this is a time where people are in and out of town, so it's going to take four or five weeks for you to receive this. Anything you can email us with any questions. Without further ado, and again, I'm going to bring that topic at the end again. We are very pleased to have our presenter today, Dr. Judy Sui. Uh, Judy Sui is a uh, research focus on the intersection of opioid use disorder, pain, and related comorbidities, meaning uh, hepatitis uh, C, HIV, and other uh, morbidities. Uh, Dr. Sue is an internal medicine physician and since 2013 is board certifying addiction med medicine to the American Board of Addiction Medicine. As a clinician investigator, she focuses on the complex relationships between substance use disorders and comorbidities and how to develop and test novel interventions to improve the lives of patients with addictions. 
Without further ado, I so now, Dr. Sui, you have to click in this web, uh, in this slide. One sec. A second. Okay. So as soon as you click in this slide, then you can move to the next ones do as uh, you want. Thank you so much. Judy, we can't hear you if you're talking. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Hope you can hear me now. So I'm going to be talking to you about medications for opioid use disorder and hepatitis C, uh, access and adherence among people who inject drugs. So these are my, uh, my disclosures of research grant support. And these are the objectives of the talk today. I'll describe the epidemiology of the opioid crisis and its overlap with hepatitis C virus infection. Review the evidence that medications for opioid use disorder, which I'll abbreviate as OUD, can prevent hepatitis C. I'll highlight research showing that medications for hepatitis C and OUD are underutilized and describe some clinical programs that we have implemented here at Harborview to address these gaps. And I'll describe a little bit of ongoing research to improve opioid use disorder and hepatitis C medication access and adherence. So first I'd like to start with some patient vignettes. Um, these are based on real patients I've seen over time. And perhaps these might be familiar stories to you as well. So TS is a 60 year old man presenting for primary care. He has a history of experimenting with heroin as a young adult. He had a back injury in his 40s and was thereby introduced to prescription opioids. Subsequently, he received high dose opioids for chronic pain and he had multiple hospitalizations for quote over sedation, which I think we can now call overdose. His primary care provider discontinued his opioids and he subsequently lapsed to heroin use. But he started on buprenorphine a year ago and has been doing well. And he's been recently diagnosed with hepatitis C. So this is another patient, CL. She is a 28 year old woman seen in the emergency department for cellulitis. She has a history of childhood physical and sexual trauma and consequent PTSD. At age 13, she's experimented with alcohol, cigarettes, and marijuana. At age 15, she's introduced to prescription opioid use, use through a friend. By age 17, she started snorting heroin, and within a year, she is injecting. She has previously had one treatment attempt with methadone, but self-discontinued. Now she's homeless. She trades sex for money and drugs, uh, and she's also recently been diagnosed with hepatitis C. So I think these uh, patient vignettes demonstrate that we are currently witnessing concurrent epidemics of opioid use disorders and hepatitis C. So how did we arrive at this point? This slide demonstrates the upward trend in opioid prescribing that has been uh, occurring from uh, since 1999 to uh, here, the slide goes to 2010, and the nearly parallel trends in increased hospitalizations and overdose uh, that have occurred. So the good news is that since 2012, opioid prescribing rates have peaked. However, they remain high at nearly 60 prescriptions written per 100 persons. Also rates vary uh, tremendously by geographic region. One alarming statistic is that in 16% of US counties, enough opioid prescriptions were dispensed such that every person could have one. We conducted a study prior to 2010 that showed that among patients who were presenting for treatment for opioid addiction, 29% reported that they were introduced to opioids through a physician's prescription. So there's now considerable national attention to the origins of the opioid crisis and the role that the pharmaceutical companies have played in promoting sales of opioids for chronic pain, as well as the role physicians have played in overprescribing. 
In addition, increasing availability of heroin and diverted pharmaceutical opioids have contributed to the opioid crisis. So although opioid prescribing rates have peaked since 2012, the bad news is that deaths related to opioids are unfortunately still increasing. So this slide shows overdose-related mortality by gender, and as you can see, there is no slowing of deaths in recent years. If anything, there is an increase in the rate around 2015, which is believed to be related to an increase in fentanyl availability. So the other major consequence of the opioid epidemic that has emerged over time is the increase in infectious diseases related to injecting drugs. The first instance of this that caught the attention of the public eye occurred in 2015, when in a small rural county in Indiana, uh, they reported a cluster of 11 new cases of HIV. So an investigation eventually found 181 cases total, nearly all who were also infected with hepatitis C, that were related to injecting a prescription opioid named Opana. So since that initial outbreak in Indiana, there have been subsequent HIV outbreaks associated with injecting drugs reported in Northeastern Massachusetts and just recently here in Seattle. As a consequence of the opioid crisis, there's actually been a shift in the epidemiology of hepatitis C with an increase in cases among young adults and in rural areas. And so this was first reported in this paper in uh, CID in 2014. So the authors examined national surveillance data of acute hepatitis C cases between 2006 and 2012. They found that nearly half the cases occurred among young adults and the majority of states reported an increase in 2012 compared to 2006. Of note, most cases were white and nearly half were women, which represents a shift in demographics as historically there's been a predominance of hepatitis C among non-whites and men. So in Massachusetts, uh, the state where I practiced prior to moving to Seattle five years ago, um, they have been very hard hit by the opioid epidemic. And as a result, they have seen a shift in the age distribution of cases with hepatitis C as witnessed in this figure. In 2002, most of the cases were concentrated among older adults, um, which we call the baby boomer generation. But by 2009, as you can see, there's a bimodal distribution of prevalence with cases nearly equally distributed between young adults and baby boomers. In Washington State, we have re recently witnessed an increase in cases of hepatitis C as well, believed to be driven by both these new infections in young adults, as well as increased diagnosis among uh, the baby boomer generation as a result of enhanced screening efforts. So these are data that were recently presented in a story in the Seattle Times. So we're really at a crossroads in time now where the magnitude of the current opioid crisis and its infectious disease consequences have become abundantly clear. And yet we have the tools to overcome this crisis. So next I'll talk about medications for opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. So the good news is that we have a number of different medications that are efficacious for treating opioid use disorders. So those medications include methadone, which is uh, obviously not new. It has been available since the 1950s. It's a full opioid agonist and is therefore highly efficacious, but it has greater risk for side effects such as sedation and overdose compared to the other medi two medications. And its other limitation is that it cannot be prescribed in an office-based setting, um, but must be dispensed in federally regulated OTPs. So the fact that it's dispensed as daily observed therapy in the OTPs can be viewed both as a therapeutic advantage, um, but an inconvenience to patients. 
Buprenorphine is a partial agonist approved in 2003. It binds tightly to opioid receptors but has sealing effects such that, such that uh, patients experience less adverse side effects. Now, Trexone is an opioid antagonist and it fully blocks opioid receptors with no opioid effects. Uh, it is available as an injectable called Vipitrol, which was FDA approved in 2010. I should note that buprenorphine is mainly prescribed these days as, sub, as a sublingual medication. However, injectable formulations just became approved this year, but they're not really widely used as of yet. So these medications have been shown in numerous studies, including uh, randomized controlled trials, to decrease opioid craving and use, overdose and mortality, HIV risk behaviors, and HIV and hepatitis C incidents. So next I'll review the evidence to demonstrate that opioid agonist therapy can prevent hepatitis C. So this is a paper that I wrote with uh, colleagues at UCSF while I was a fellow there. And it was looking at the association between opioid agonist therapy and incidence of hepatitis C virus infection among young adult uh, persons who inject drugs. So the study used data from the, the UFO study, which was an observational cohort study of young adult injectors in the San Francisco area, and they were enrolled and followed between 2000 and 2013. So participants were hepatitis C uninfected, and they were followed quarterly with surveys and hepatitis C viral load testing. So the sample uh, included 552 participants, and the median age was 23, um, and most participants were white males who injected heroin. The majority reported no substance use treatment in the prior year, which does speak to care delivery gaps. So there were 171 new cases of hepatitis C that occurred over 680 person years of observation. So we compared the incidence of new hepatitis C infections among persons in four groups. Those who reported no drug treatment in the past four months, those who reported non-OA drug treatment, so that could be counseling or 12-step groups, those who reported detoxification, and those who reported treatment with opioid agonist therapy, um, either methadone or buprenorphine. And as you can see, the incidence was markedly lower among the opioid agonist therapy group compared to the others. So adjusted Cox proportional hazards models demonstrated that maintenance OAT was independently and significantly associated with lower relative hazards for becoming infected with hepatitis C over time. So about a 60% reduction in incidence. In 2017, Cochrane published a systematic review of studies that looked at the effects of opioid agonist therapy on hepatitis C incidence that included our study with 11 other studies from North America, uh, Europe, and Australia. And as you can see, all the studies had uh, strikingly similar findings demonstrating benefits in reducing incidence of hepatitis C over time. So that review concluded that OAT reduces the risk of hepatitis C acquisition by 50%. However, uh, this was based on 12 observational studies, not randomized controlled trials. Therefore, they did say that the quality of the evidence uh, was still low. We published a subsequent study that suggested there might actually be an attenuated effect um, in females compared to males. So in considering the economic implications, um, I would like to point out that the cost of treating opioid use disorder uh, is relatively inexpensive compared to the cost of treating hepatitis C. So both methadone and buprenorphine are priced at around $6,000 per year of treatment. In contrast, the sticker cost for treat treating hepatitis C with sofosavir-based regimen is about $84,000, although admittedly the price of um, hepatitis C meds has come down um, now that there are multiple uh, regimens on the market. 
but it's also worth keeping in mind the additional cost savings that occur with opioid use disorder treatment in preventing overdose, injury, other infectious complications such as osteomyelitis, endocarditis, etc. So I think when framing it as such, it becomes obvious that opioid use disorder treatment is a worthwhile investment. But I don't want to downplay the importance of new medications for hepatitis C. So now we'll shift gears to talk about the recent revolution in hepatitis C treatment. So the emergence of direct acting antivirals or DEAs has radically uh, changed the hep C treatment paradigm. So Fosivir was the first DA to come in the scene um, in 2013, but now there exist multiple regimens, including medications that will treat all genotypes, so are pangenotypic. So we've really reached a new era where nearly all patients can be cured of hepatitis C with just 8 to 12 weeks of oral medications with few side effects. So this slide uh, shows how radically different treatment today uh, looks like compared to treatment during the interferon era, where patients had to take weekly shots in addition to daily pills, um, and most patients had side effects, and at the end of the day, there was only a 50-50 chance of being cured. So you might or might not be aware that in the fall of 2018, Governor Jay Inslee announced a statewide initiative to eliminate hepatitis C. So this is a photo of him in the uh, Harborview Liver Clinic with a patient. So the name of that initiative is Hep C Free Washington. So this is not just a statewide goal, as WHO has also announced the same ambitious goal to achieve hepatitis C elimination uh, globally by 2030. And there's overwhelming uh, consensus that treating active persons who inject drugs is essential for achieving that goal. So treating the baby boomer generation is the most effective strategy reducing immediate complications related to hepatitis C, such as cirrhosis and liver cancer, and those related costs. But for reducing incidence and prevalence over time, we must focus on treating the individuals who are responsible for forward transmission. So this concept of treating infected individuals to reduce incidence of new infections over time, i.e. treatment as prevention, is something we saw prove, proven for HIV. This slide shows data from uh, colleagues in Vancouver, Canada. The red line depicts the number of patients with HIV who are on ART, while the blue line shows the number of new HIV diagnoses. And as you can see, the new infection rate is inversely proportional to increased numbers of persons who are placed on ART. So it is believed that treatment as prevention should also apply for hepatitis C. And the rationale being that DA cure rates among people who inject drugs appear to be nearly equivalent to non-PWID. And as well, reinfection is thought to be a relatively rare occurrence um, and, and in theory can be prevented with OIT and syringe service programs. However, admittedly more real world data is needed on reinfection rates and to demonstrate treatment as prevention uh, for hepatitis C. So the current guidelines for the Amer from the American Association of Study of Liver Diseases and the Infectious Disease Society of America are very clear that all persons with chronic hepatitis C should be treated. And they even state that the scale up of hepatitis C treatment in persons who inject drugs is necessary to positively impact the hepatitis C epidemic in the US and globally. So how much scale up is needed? This slide shows data from a modeling study that looked at how differing rates of treatment among PWID would impact future prevalence. So what I'd like you to appreciate is that 
even relatively small differences in the numbers treated, say going from 20 to 40 persons per thousand, has a fairly large impact on future prevalence. So extending treatment to even small numbers of PWID can uh, apparently make a big difference. So I hope I've convinced you that there are highly efficacious medications that can impact these concurrent epidemics of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. But the question is, uh, are patients who are eligible for these medications able to receive them? So next, we'll review the evidence on treatment delivery gaps and some programs that we have implemented at Harborview to address. So my colleague Sarah Glick and I conducted a study to examine the prevalence of reporting treatment with opioid agonist therapy, i.e. either methadone or buprenorphine, among people who inject drugs in the Seattle metropolitan area. So the study used 2015 data from NHBS, which is a survey of HIV prevalence and behavioral risks that's conducted annually, with every three years being focused on adult PWID. Because the national survey asked only about any treatment for addiction in the past year, we added questions to our local survey that focused specifically on use of either buprenorphine or methadone. So the sample was comprised of 487 persons who injected drugs who reported opioid use. Of those, the vast majority, 70%, reported no past year treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine, speaking to major treatment gaps. The treatment that was more frequently reported was methadone, 27 reported past year treatment. At this time, in 2015, only 5% reported past year buprenorphine treatment, and twice as many reported that they tried to get buprenorphine treatment but were unable, speaking to barriers. So we use the same 2015 data set to explore access to treatment for hepatitis C among persons who inject drugs. This is what we found the cascade of care for hepatitis C looks among Seattle area PWID. Starting with a sample of 338 persons who inject drugs who were hepatitis C antibody positive, we found that the majority of them reported um, having previously been screened and being aware of their diagnosis, which is good news. The bad news is that only 7% reported ever having completed treatment, speaking to major gaps. It is, of course, important to note that the data from the study were collected in 2015. So this was only two years after the arrival of the first DEA, Sofosfavir. Data from 2018 are currently being analyzed and it will be interesting to see how this has changed. So those results I showed you were for active um, PWID, the majority who are probably not engaged in care. Um, you might wonder if the cascade would look different for persons who are actively engaged in addiction treatment and primary care. So we did a study to map out the hep C care cascade among patients who were receiving buprenorphine treatment in a primary care clinic at Boston Medical Center. And sadly, um, the care cascade did not look dramatically different. We found that uh, similarly, many of those patients had received testing, but very few were treated. Only 2% of those with chronic infection uh, had initiated treatment even though uh, nearly 50% of those diagnosed had seen a specialist. Again, admittedly, this is pre-DA era data, um, so it will be uh, important to see how this changes in the DA era. So next I'll turn to describe uh, some current programs that we have implemented to address opioid use disorder treatment gaps. But first, we need to understand the reasons for such treatment gaps. We know that there are substantial barriers to treatment, both on the provider and patient side. To prescribe buprenorphine requires completing an AR training and applying to the DEA for a special license. 
And this in itself is unfortunately a barrier. Currently, there's some federal legislation pending that could remove this requirement, but for now it exists. Historically, of course, only physicians could prescribe buprenorphine, although recently that has changed to allow nurse practitioners and PAs to prescribe. There has been uh, a lack of training of medical students and residents to prescribe uh, in the past, and also the stigma of opioid use disorder makes some physicians disinclined to take on caring for this patient population. We also know that even well-intentioned providers who do get waivers often don't prescribe. And studies cite lack of time and cl clinic infrastructure support, um, as, we, as well as fear of medication diversion as barriers. In January of 2016, prior to fully implementing our office-based buprenorphine program, we conducted a survey to assess uh, interest in prescribing buprenorphine among providers in our adult medicine clinic at Harborview. So we surveyed 27 residents and 17 attendings and found that at that time, the majority, 89%, did not have waivers to prescribe but that many, 67%, had high interest in prescribing. So younger age and belief in buprenorphine effectiveness were significantly associated with high interest in prescribing, speaking to the need to target younger um, resident providers. So responding to uh, younger physicians' desires to become uh, buprenorphine wavered, we implemented a program for training medical students to prescribe buprenorphine with support from SAMHSA. So we just completed uh, the trainings for medical students and are very pleased to say that we surpassed our goals with 60 medical students who, who um, as you can see, are bound for many different residency programs after graduation. Through surveys that we did uh, pre and post training, we found that student confidence increased uh, from 21 to 90 percent with the training. And nearly all these students plan to obtain their waiver, uh, although we'll continue to track them to see how many actually follow through and prescribe in their residency. So we have residency trainings that are planned for this summer and have trained um, most of our residents at Harborview to date. So next, I'd like to tell you a bit about our buprenorphine program that we implemented uh, around January 2016 at Harborview. And I'll also share some outcome data from our program. So we partnered with the state and Evergreen Treatment Services, um, receiving a grant from SAMHSA to implement a collaborative care model for office-based buprenorphine treatment in the adult medicine clinic. And as you recall, a major barrier for primary care providers to prescribe buprenorphine is uh, cited as a lack of time and clinic support. So we adapted this collaborative care model that uses a nurse care manager as the center of clinical activities that was um, originally pioneered at Boston Medical Center. So we've had some great success with that model um, and have subsequently acquired new funding to expand this program beyond the adult medicine clinic and even beyond Harborview. So those of you, of you who might be interested in more uh, description of the Massachusetts collaborative care model and other models of del delivery of care, I'll refer you to this excellent review article that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2016. So this slide shows substance use outcomes of 422 patients who were treated with buprenorphine through our uh, MAP-PADOA, our buprenorphine program from 2015 to 2017. The slide uh, compares past 30 days substance use at baseline versus six months among patients. And as you can see, there are impressive declines in the use of opioids and even other non-opioid drugs in the treated sample. So any opioid use went down by 73%, and even methamphetamine use went down by 56%. So furthermore, there were significant differences in acute healthcare utilization. 
at six months, the percentage of patients reporting an emergency department visit or hospitalization in the past 30 days went down, and differences between baseline and six months were significant. Unsurprisingly, outpatient treatment went up since this care is offered in an outpatient setting. And also we hope that by engaging patients in opioid use disorder treatment, they'll address other health issues um, such as their hepatitis C. So in addition to provider-related barriers, we must acknowledge patient-level barriers. So one such barrier is that patients, most patients with substance use disorder do not perceive a use disorder and do not seek treatment. As a result, it becomes critical to offer opioid use disorder medications in medical contexts where patients with opioid use disorder are being seen, but where treatment has not historically been offered. So two such examples of that are the emergency department and the hospital inpatient setting. So studies have shown the benefits of offering buprenorphine in both these settings. Um, and currently we have efforts underway at Harborview to provide um, buprenorphine in both the emergency department and also uh, for hospitalized patients. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that pa uh, paper that looked at the impact of offering buprenorphine among hospitalized patients, since that was, uh, was a study I was also involved with in Boston. So that study recruited hospitalized patients with opioid use disorders, so either heroin or prescription opioids, who were not already in addiction treatment. And it randomized patients to receive either linkage, which was induction with buprenorphine followed by a prescription to bridge them to an outpatient appointment, or detox, um, which was induction with buprenorphine to manage just the acute withdrawal followed by a taper over five days. So that study enrolled 139 subjects um, and had a six month follow-up period. And the study found that patients in the linkage arm compared to detox were more likely to enter outpatient treatment, and they were more likely to be retained in outpatient treatment at six months, although as you can see, the retention rates were quite low even in the linkage arm. And they were significantly um, less likely to be using illicit opioids at six months by self-report. So another important reason for the medication treatment gap that I've already alluded to um, are the suboptimal rates of adherence and retention. So this is particularly a problem uh, for buprenorphine compared to methadone. Methadone has been shown to have better retention in studies. And in fact, we saw this in the earlier study that I presented to you um, that showed uh, that uh, looked at self-report of treatment with methadone or buprenorphine in the past year among people who inject drugs. So in that study, we asked participants um, who had reported treatment how long they had been treated in, uh, in the past year. And we found that among those who reported methadone treatment, the majority had been on medication for more than six months, which is good, which is maintenance treatment. But for buprenorphine, it was the opposite. Most individuals who had been treated reported that they received medications for three months or less. So studies suggest that about 50% of patients who initiate buprenorphine will drop out within six to 12 months. And this is data from our program showing that we're just average in this respect. Um, so clearly there's a lot of room for improvement in this area. So next I'll talk a little bit about uh, research studies that test novel healthcare interventions to improve adherence and outcomes for patients with opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. So um, this is a recently published study that's looking at intensive models of hepatitis C care for people who inject drugs who are also receiving opioid agonist therapy um, that was conducted by colleagues uh, out in New York City. Um, 
So this study recruited hep C uh, positive adults in three OHE programs in Bronx, and it randomized patients to receive either directly observed therapy, so these were actually methadone clinics, um, group therapy, or self-administered individual treatment, which was just treatment as usual, patients taking their medications on their own. And so the study measured uh, adherence to medications through the use of electronic blister packs. So this figure shows the adherence rates to hepatitis C medications over time. Um, and as you can see, the treatment as usual, the self-direct, um, self-administered treatment had the lowest rate of adherence uh, and it appeared to diminish over time so that towards the end of the study uh, or the end of treatment, only about 75% were, uh, of their doses were being taken. But the study did show that there were very high uh, cure rates in this population. So SVR stands for sustained virologic response and is the measure of hepatitis C cure um, that's being undetectable 12 weeks after the completion of treatment. And as you can see, the SVR rates in the three arms uh, range from 90% to 98%. So nearly everyone is getting cured. So the study concluded that um, DOT was associated with slightly better rates of adherence. And actually adherence was found to be significantly associated with likelihood of care. However, all models of care, even the treatment as usual, resulted in very high rates of cure, 90 to 98%. And the overall adherence uh, rate in the study was 78%. And given that 94% of that of the sample was cured, it suggests that lower adherence might be tolerated uh, with hepatitis C treatment. So what about opioid use disorder medication adherence? I told you that retention is poor. Um, there are also some studies to show that non-adherence to medications is quite common with buprenorphine. One study suggested that um, 30 percent of doses um, were not taken, and that study did show also that non-adherence correlated with illicit opioid use. So we have a study uh, that was funded by NIDA to pilot and test um, an adherence app for buprenorphine treatment. So this app allows patients to upload videos of themselves taking their medication, which can be reviewed later um, in a provider portal. So we just completed phase one, which was a qualitative study and a pilot feasibility study, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, those results. So we first just did a qualitative study um, to look at provider and patient perspectives on barriers to buprenorphine adherence and also the acceptability of uh, video directly observed therapy to enhance adherence. So these are some quotes um, from patients, what they said about adherence. Sometimes I've forgotten in the afternoon when you're busy not really thinking about it. There's been times that I've just said throughout the day, hey, I forgot my, to take my Suboxone. So there did seem to be some unintentional forgetting. Um, however, another patient said this, and these are his words, not mine. Um, it's just because us addicts, whether everyone else wants to admit it or not, we like to get high. And taking the medicine, we can't get high if we're taking it like we should. That's why I wouldn't want to take it all the time. So the response to the idea of video directly observed therapy was generally favorable. Here's one patient quote. The Suboxone program in general relies a lot on trust and communication between the patient and provider um, or providers, you know. So I think that uh, video DOT would be good. Everybody could be on the same page. They feel good about it, especially when you're changing doses or have had maybe problems in the past staying on the program. I think it would help hold people accountable. So 
So given that um, generally positive response, we conducted a small pilot feasibility study that enrolled 14 subjects to use the app for four weeks. Um, and from that study, we found that uh, all participants but one were able to successfully upload videos. Uh, most, uh, 10 out of 14 of the participants reported that they were satisfied or very satisfied with using the app. Two out of 14 were, were neutral, but none were dissatisfied. And for those who were able to use the app, daily buprenorphine treatment was confirmed through videos 73% uh, of the time. So the results of these stu this study suggested that use of a smartphone app to allow at home video directly observed therapy of buprenorphine treatment is both feasible and acceptable. So now we've moved on to phase two, um, which is a two site randomized controlled trial of using the app versus treatment as usual that's being conducted at Harborview and at Boston Medical Center. So um, we're in the midst of enrolling subjects for that study right now. And we're having the participants use the app for 12 weeks um, and looking at our primary outcome of uh, illicit opiate use measured by percentage of weekly urine drug tests that are positive for opioids. Um, we'll also be looking at retention and treatment as well as another important outcome. So summary conclusions, um, the epidemics of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C virus infection are closely intertwined. Elimination of hepatitis C is a state, national, and global priority and it requires treating persons who inject drugs. Efficacious medications exist for both opioid use disorder and hepatitis C, and yet are underutilized by patients who might benefit. Numerous programs have been developed at University of Washington and Harborview to address opioid use disorder and have seen treatment gaps and other, other places as well. Um, and we have ongoing research that's testing whether an mHealth intervention for video DOT can improve outcomes. So I'd like to acknowledge my um, community partners in some of the research that I've shown you. And in particular, I want to thank all the patient participants um, who uh, we could not conduct this research without their support. I also want to acknowledge our um, office-based opioid treatment team at Harborview, and we've grown quite a bit, so this slide is not nearly as complete as it should be. And then I guess I'll take any questions now. Um, yeah, so before questions, uh, let me say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sue. That was very, uh, very good. And before we take questions, we always like to remind the participants today that we can offer these services like this wonderful webinar uh, if we report uh, to our funders of your uh, input so we get better and uh, we keep being able to provide the service. So please, we're going to send two short surveys, one now and one in a month for you guys to respond. We really appreciate your honest feedback and mostly your feedback <laughs> and how uh, you are, um, you are, you, you're going to receive a small compensation for five dollars uh, when you respond this, uh, um, this surveys to us. Um, Rebranding again. Again, we are lucky uh, this time to, uh, to be partnered with AHAC Western Washington. Uh, this webinar is eligible for uh, CME credit. Uh, people that do not use CME credits can use it as a certificate of attendance to get uh, continuing education credits uh, in the way it works for them. You don't have to do anything. They will be emailed to you in a few weeks. However, if you are watching this, there's three people watching the front of the same computer with one email, one registration. The only way we are going to know you're more than one person is if you email to us. The, uh, the 
email address attached to your registration and the people attending to uh, the address uh, in this slide. We will uh, then, uh, we will ask you to do this by 9 a.m. tomorrow Pacific time. Okay, so we are now open for uh, questions. Uh, you can type at any time. I'm going to have a first question here. So, um, Dr. Sue, are there any interactions between hepatitis C medications and uh, medications for opioid use disorders that we should be concerned about? Um, no, there are not. Um, as I showed you, there are studies that have um, demonstrated that people who are on methadone and buprenorphine can have um, excellent treatment outcomes and it's safe to use um, the hep C meds with those medications. There are some interactions with other drugs such as um, PPI, some seizure medications, um, statins. So I think if you have a patient who's on other medications, it's always a good idea to check in with the pharmacist um, either where you're, you know, getting the prescriptions um, per, uh, from uh, or a pharmacist in your clinic just to make sure that there aren't any interactions that you need to know about. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question here uh, saying very nice research. I know this is not directly relevant to your presentation, but what observations, incidental or otherwise, have you had regarding Kraton? Uh, which uh, many people who misuse opioid uh, attribute to their recovery. Oh my goodness. You know, I think that's actually out of the scope of my um, expertise. So I think I will refrain from commenting. <laughs> yeah, no, not a problem whatsoever. And the question is really already framed that this might be really uh, different from uh, what the kind of expertise and research you do. Okay, let's try another question. Thanks so much. Uh, can individuals who fail treatment uh, or get reinfected with HIV uh, get treated again? Yes, we do have medications for patients who have fa uh, fail initial uh, first line regimens. Um, and, you know, patients who fail because they had interruptions or discontinue their medications, they can also be treated again um, with the same medication. So uh, yes, failure does not mean that a patient cannot eventually get cured. Very good, thank you. Is this question here maybe in the middle or is that what it is? Uh, I think it just got cut off. Maybe I did. think a question got caught off in the middle. We're going to go to another question I have, but there is a Paul Costello, I think, cut in the middle. Um, so uh, another question. Uh, how do you approach uh, treatment for HCV in someone who is actively using drugs? Uh, some important things to counsel them about it? Yeah, so I think it's um, important to counsel them on, uh, of course, um, safe injecting behaviors. To, so to make sure that they're not sharing any injecting, uh, injecting equipment, syringes, um, needles, cotton, rinses, everything, uh, while they're going through treatment so they don't get reinfected. It's also important to counsel them that they don't reuse their own equipment if they're um, using while during treatment, because potentially, you know, the virus can live in syringes for up to three weeks, um, and they could sort of re-expose themselves during treatment. Um, of course, you know, we want to offer as much support as we can um, and encourage patients to um, receive treatment for their use disorder if they're willing to do that. So offering buprenorphine, um, or methadone or other medications is important, even if it's just during treatment, um, if they are feeling ambivalent about long-term treatment. Um, it's of course important to address all the psychosocial factors as well. Um, for patients who are homeless, this might be challenging um, and you know, efforts to, should be made to house them. At Harborview, we have a, a respite uh, program, and actually, I understand that they have just um, 
uh, made uh, arrangements so that patients who are homeless, um, who they who need they think will have you know strong likelihood of not being cured otherwise, can be admitted to that program for their uh, treatment. So um, it's really all about trying to support the patient so that they can successfully adhere to their med medications and get cured and that they don't get reinfected. Great, thanks. Okay, so the question that I thought was a question was a comment. I'm gonna read the comment and then uh, move to a second uh, request here. Uh, so uh, Dr. Costello says, thanks for sharing your thoughts and work as a hospice doctor and a CHC doctor. I love seeing suboxone patients stabilize and have C patients get SC SVRs. So that was the comment. Uh, then we have another one uh, request. Would you mind putting a plug, which I'm doing right now, for the 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 draft Hep C free Washington plan is open for public comment uh, for one more week, and there is a link here that uh, of uh, everybody has access to see to the question to the chat uh, is at uh, DOH Wagov. Yeah, so um, I'll put in even more of a plug. Yes. <laughs> Since I'm on the um, hepatitis uh, C, the elimination committee that um, helped to put this draft together. So a lot of work went into this um, plan and at the same time, we want to make sure that um, we get everybody's opinions um, on it. And so would definitely encourage everybody listening to to take a look at it and to provide um, comments as they see fit. Perfect, what a serendipity, that's wonderful. Um, so uh, we, uh, we wanna remind you for that we, our webinar continues during summer as well. You can join us uh, to the next webinar on methamphetamine. Uh, and uh, uh, we have one more question here before we wrap up. Sorry that I put the thank you beforehand. So do you know if they are creating a hep C a vaccine? Yeah, so there is a hep C vaccine um, trial that's going on. In fact, I think that they are, they've completed it. And so they should be coming out with results soon. Um, some of the investigators that I work on on other studies um, are involved with that. And so I think the idea is that would be another piece, that would be another component in addition to treatment and treatment elimination that would allow us to um, uh, get the incidence down to the point of elimination that, you know, by that would just be another thing that would then hopefully prevent um, new infections um, and possibly reinfection. So yeah, I would look out for that study. I think um, results should be fairly soon forthcoming. Great. Okay, so yeah, wrapping up, I'm gonna read a comment that uh, we wanna uh, join uh, the comment as well as a wrap up. Thank you so much for your participation. And the comment says, great work. I'm so appreciative that you took the chance on treating this population while they are not fully into recover, recovery because so often this population is denied treatment for the other conditions. Uh, such as, you know, uh, surgery, screen, uh, skin graft, etc. So they get so discouraged about addressing their medical conditions. Uh, I hope we can change the culture of how providers deal with this population by more work like yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, <laughs> for all your hard work. And I will say, you know, it is so gratifying to treat and cure patients of hepatitis C um, they are so grateful to, to receive this medication and to get cures, you know. They know that it's a lot of money and a lot of investment and it really, I think, means a lot to this population and, and does a lot towards, um, you know, facilitating uh, better health outcomes altogether. Okay, thank you so much again and I hope you attendees to see you next month. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.